up our hands. We're, we're, we're telling God, you are the center of everything. You're the center of everything, Father. So God, we give you all the glory. We give you our breath, our heart, our mind, our soul, Lord God. It all belongs to you. Because you're holy. You're holy. And we give it to you, Lord. So thank you, God, that we could be in your presence in this gathering, Lord, under one name, King Jesus. Lord, we love you, and we want our hearts transformed. We want our hearts transformed. We want our hearts molded, changed, to be like you, God, to walk talk every day like you father we thank you that we in your presence in Jesus name and all God's people say amen let's give God a clap offering you may be seated thank you worship team praise the Lord God is good God is good Thank you, Father. Who's blessed today? As you all know, Pastor, our lead pastor, senior pastor, David Ham, is not here today. He's in, he's in a wonderful island of Jamaica. <laughs> he's chilling. Amen. Does he deserve it? He deserves it, to rest with his wife, and he was doing a wedding over there. And he says, can I stay a little, a couple more days? And uh, he tasked me to bring the word today. It's all about Jesus, amen? Man, I've been, I've been thinking about this word for a while. And my prayer as a pastor, my prayer as a leader and, and leading people and loving on people is a prayer that, that we walk all like Jesus. That we will be imitators of Christ. Amen? You, you don't need a title to be a, a follower of Jesus. You, you don't need, you know, you're a senior pastor, so now you could be a follower of Jesus. He's called you out. And he's leading you towards him. Amen? Today I want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. I want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Walk by the fruit. And it's in Galatians chapter 5. And it reads like this, but before I read, I want to pray and ask the Lord to touch our hearts. Because sometimes our hearts are not in line or you came today and heavy burden or you're, you just came because you were forced here? Not this church, right? The other church down the block. But you're here because you love being a part of the church. I don't know about you. Who loves being part of the church? This is the hope of the world, guys. I love being a part of the church now because I... This, literally, this world is crumbling before our eyes. I don't know about you, but yesterday was a very tense moment for me last night. As I was studying and getting, putting everything together, I'm watching the news. And it's literally an historic moment. At 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, on the other side of the world, there's a nation, a sovereign nation being bombarded by 300 rockets from another sovereign nation. I don't know about you guys, but this is real stuff. 
That is why I love my church and love the body of Christ. Even that's going on around the world, we still are in the hands of God. And God is still in control. There's so many events happening and God is still in control. Who saw the eclipse? I'm not, not going to tell you God's coming to um, Listen. I'm not going to be a conspiracy theory. See, he crossed the, no. But that was a, an exciting moment. And the only thing I would do in that moment is praise the Lord. He is God. He's real. He's sovereign. And then the earthquake. <laughs> earthquake and the eclipse. Like, God, you better come hurry up, Lord. I'm ready for you. I was in the car. I was like, oh, the wind is blowing hard today. <laughs> Seriously, I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. But then two seconds there, earthquake, 4.8. Welcome to the end of the world. God is still sovereign. The church is still alive. And the church is still moving. I want us to understand that. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your bride. We thank you for your people that you rescued and saved and loved before we ever loved you. Lord, we thank you for saving more and bringing more to the kingdom. And Lord God, we can wait to see in the blink of an eye you coming for your bride. Lord God, it's going to be a rejoices day, Lord God. But Father, we put our trust, our hope, our love to you and only you, Lord. And our ears to your word. And our walk to your spirit. And that's it, Lord. Teach us your ways today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23... And we all hear this verse before, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, who needs that, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. That's it, church. Go home. You got the message today. This is what we need to do. But I want to go a little deeper in this because there's a word called... But, there's, what's that called, babe? Conjunction. Sorry. All morning, baby, what's this word? It should be like, am I, conjunct, I was bad in English, okay, okay, okay. There's a conjunction word here. There's a connection. This is at the end of the, of the chapter 5. What is he talking about in, chap, in verse 1? What is he saying here that he had to say that? And now as I read it, I was like, whoa. Polito was really, Paul, was really, was really a little tough here. Basically what happened was, I'll, I'll, I'll break down the, the New York way. Basically what happened was, let me go on Basically what happened was, Paul heard about something happening within the church that he helped build. He's a church planter. And he helped build and he heard this rumbling about the Christians in the church of Galatia that they were talking about something that was different from the gospel. Now Paul didn't walk in and say, hey guys, let's stop. Paul went in and he said, look. You ever heard someone say, look? Parents, right? Look. People, people might look and where, where, where? But then there's, there's a look. There's a word. Yo, look, do me a favor and look at this. Paul says to the Galatians, it says, look and listen to me. There is no gospel but Jesus. There's no other way to know and be saved than Jesus. Because there were a couple of people that says, hey, look at the new Christians and Gentiles. Hey, 
You know what? You have to be really saved. You have to be circumcised. And then you have to follow the law. Now, Paul was livid. It doesn't say it there, but he was mad. He was mad because why would you come and why would you distort the gospel, the church of God, by something else and then, rather than the gospel? Why would you do that? And he basically tells them, do not listen to that man. Do not listen to that group. There's no other way but Jesus. You are free in Christ Jesus through the cross and through the resurrection. And Paul gets really upset. Church, I would ask you, how is your attitude when you hear something different? I would ask you a question. Does your spirit move when something is, doesn't line up with the word of God? I would ask you, are you paying attention? Because we're living in a world that everything is truth. We're living in a society that I could believe in this and I don't have to do that. Even in the church. We need to be people that listen to the right direction. And Paul literally breaks it down. And the second part of this one, he says, if you do not listen to what I've been teaching, if you do not listen to this aspect of the word, guess what's going to happen? You will walk in your flesh. And if you walk in your flesh, you will produce fleshly things. So you need to listen to the word because if you do not, you're going to fall into this temptation of the flesh. The flesh is real, amen? The flesh is, will corrupt us and take us away from God's plan over your life. And this is what he says. He goes, follow this, but if you walk by the Spirit, if you, if you live by the Spirit, you will bear much fruit. It's a warning to the church that we need to be a church that is filled with the Spirit of God that produces this. I love when people ask me, hey, Danny, what church you go to? I love that. Two things I love when people ask me. One question is, uh, what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, I can't wait to tell you what I do for a living. I preach the gospel. I love saying that I work with kids in prison. I, do, I, I love sharing the story. But when someone says, what church you go to? I'd be like, yo. I go to Soul Cry. The new kids on the block. I walk like this too. like have that limp. I'm from Soul Cry Church. Where you at? Long Island City. Nas is from there. I get all like gangster. Like. So, right? We get excited. My, who, who is my pastor? You don't, you don't know my pastor? <laughs> pastor David Ham. Let me give you his resume. <laughs> you heard about Nicky Cruz? He started it. No, he started it. I get all excited. Where are you from? i excited about telling people about, about you know, you gave me my boy Fred. Fred's an awesome guy, a man of God. My boy Jensen goes to our church too. I'm excited to mention about people coming to church. But I, I don't want to fall into a trap of that. That's my identity. Because we fall into this American trap of saying, oh, my pastor does this. Come on, somebody. We, uh, my, 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 we, we got a nice building. I'll be saying we have a nice building. I'll be saying it. I was right inside. I've been saying it. We got a parking lot. I'll be saying it. We got a gym. We got a gym. Come on. We got bathrooms. We don't own the building yet. Come on, somebody. No, I'm just... We get kicked out next week. My bad, my bad. 
But I'm excited to share this, but I might fall into the temptation of that, that this is my identity. And I love what, I, what we do here. Two years celebrating in May. Come on, somebody. Two years celebrating what God has done. Birth out of Pastor Dave and his wife. And then we're here today. But our identity is not in the Soul Cry logo. Our identity is not in the beautiful reels on social media. And yes, it is all true that we are in the spirit, but I want to don't fall into a trap that this is my identity. We are people of God that love Jesus and only Jesus, and that we're filled with the spirit of the Lord. And that we walk in it. And Paul wants to make sure of that to the people of Galatia. You are all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Now walk in it. Walk in the spirit. This same attitude that Paul had going in there and wrestling with this false doctrine and legalism and falseness and false that is the same attitude that Jesus walked into the temple. Jesus did even worse. He started flipping, ta flipping tables, took a whip out. He was Latino. He took the whip out. Who ever got whipped before? My father, bro. I still got a scar. Let's, let's. Flipping tables. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's gentle, kind, good, patient, self-control, but not when he walks into a temple or a place that should be prayer. Because God's a jealous God. And he's going to flip tables in our lives and say, no, 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 no. Your family, your home, your heart belongs to me. And that same attitude that he had and Paul's attitude that we had, we need the same thing. An attitude of walking in the spirit of God and nothing changing our direction. I'm not going to allow politics to change my direction. I'm not going to allow money to change my direction. I'm not going to allow who I know change my direction. I'm going to allow the Spirit of God to keep me aligned. And Jesus wants us to know when you walk in the Spirit and you live by the Spirit, you will produce the Spirit. What does that Spirit produce? What does that Spirit bring? And this is where I want to land with you, church. I want you, we're going to talk about nine things. I'm sorry, it's not three points. But nine things that I want us to really dive in. And I want to ask a question. Do you identify with these nine things? Because if you do not, I want to challenge you to your ear to the word of God. Because this is the evidence that you're walking with Jesus. Because it says here there is no law after this. This is it. Walking in the spirit. Galatians was a people that were confused and Paul brought it straight to the point. You want to walk in the flesh? This is going to happen to you. But I've called you to walk in the spirit. God has called you to walk in the spirit. Number one, he gives us love. John chapter 15, 13 says this, greater love at no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. That's the love that we have, this gape love. The love that you have never experienced and you would never see if it wasn't for Jesus. The love that God gives us, the love that he is love. True love involves self-sacrifice, putting the needs and well-being of others before your own. How hard is that? You could be honest with me. We could be honest together. That love is hard to do, hard to give. But guess what? It's not from you. It's from God. We need to acknowledge that it's not from us because if it was from us, I'm loving certain people. I'm giving my love to just certain people. But this love that God has given you is a love for all people. And the Galatians had to hear this. 
I want to ask you, can we do this? I love when uh, I, uh, Pastor Travis, I'm sorry. I say it again. My bad. But it, he said it yes last week. There's a prescription. I, I, this prescription I will give you is this. Choosing to act in others' best interest. Do you know, and I would say this all together, but do you know that every single nine of these things that God has given us that you can use every day? It's not that Monday you love and Tuesday you don't. Amen? So I encourage you, when you see somebody, know somebody, how do you act with them? Is it your interest or their interest? Even at the personal cost. How many friends you've been around with that you lost something? God is asking us to be that individual. This involves sacrificing of time and resources. This seems a lot, right? It seems a lot to give, but that's the beauty of Jesus because he is the ultimate example of love. On the cross, in his burial and resurrection, he showed us love. Number two, joy. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray continuously, give thanks to all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice, this is hard. Now, if this is hard for you, write it down. Can I encourage you to do that? Write it down. I wrote at least three. At least because I know that I need this. And I know this for a fact, church. As I mentioned these things, I know you weren't, you didn't grow up in a lot of these things. I know we have struggled at homes and situations. Denny, I've never experienced this love because my home was broken. I never experienced joy because I was always being yelled at. How can I be joyful when my dad left me? How can I be joyful when my, my, my parents didn't want to deal with me? I understand the pain we're all going through. But when, I, when the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit, that means it grows. Come on, somebody. It grows. The more you in Christ, the more it grows out of you. So don't think you're coming crazy. Hey, oh, I'm joyful. No. no. Come to the altar. I'm ready. Good luck. Because it's going to be painful. You grow in all of this. You grow in all of this. I need you to on the, write that down. We grow in all of this. We need to be joyful. Joy is a state of heart that remains steadfast in faith and gratitude towards God. Even in the ups and downs. There were times in my life that I did not want to rejoice. There are times in our lives that we didn't want to give God the thanks. And God does not look at us and say, oh, you, you just ruined your whole eternity life. He, he doesn't look at us and con condemn us, but he shows us. To maintain this positive outlook... And inner happiness, regardless of their circumstances, this joy is rooted in faith. I would challenge you, when you wake up in the morning, I challenge you, when you go into circumstances, think of joy. This joy doesn't come in and out like the world's joy. This joy is a confidence that God has everything under control. As I saw these bombs going over Israel and Jerusalem, and I've once visited that place, and I've seen that place, and I'm saying, how can people have joy in this circumstance while they're huddling and not to get killed? God is asking us in that circumstance, be joyful. Isn't that crazy? But it only comes from God. 
Jesus showed us this. Despite facing suffering, Jesus possessed a deep-seated joy rooted in his relationship with the Father. He spoke of this joy to his disciples. He wanted their joy to be complete in him. His joy was not doing the Father's will. Was, was, his joy was doing the Father's will in salvation of souls. He's the one that fulfilled it, even in his earthly circumstances. Now, we're talking about Jesus here. And you're wondering to yourself, well, he's God. He could do all things. I'm just a man. I'm just this. I'm this, that. No, God was 100% human when he walked on earth. And he was the prime example for all of us. And if he can do it with the Spirit of God, guess what? You can do it. Amen? The enemy wants you to say, you can't do it. The enemy wants you to tell you, there's no way you could succeed. Keep on going to church on Sunday. Keep on going. It's okay. But throughout the week, guess what? You're not going to survive. That's what the enemy wants to do. You think, you think that as pastors, the devil doesn't do it to us? Let me tell you something right now. Mondays are tough. Tuesdays too. Wednesdays are horrible. The hump day. Thursdays. I don't know. And then we got to come back again on Sundays. Saturdays are chill. But it's a tough week. Christianity is not telling you your week is going to be great after Sunday. It's not. That's false gospel. Amen? It's not. What's going to be is that you're in love with God throughout the week. You're filled with joy throughout the week. Amen? I want to walk in that. I want to walk in that. And I encourage you to walk the same. Number three, peace. Now this is hard. This is one of my little notes. Peace. This is where I struggle. Literally struggle. This is where I need to go deeper. Peace. Part of, I think, my DNA in my family is that we worry a lot. I blame my mom. She's not here, so. My mom used to worry for everything. There was no cell phones back then. They were just beepers. But that was for my girl, you know. I mean, my wife, yeah, Diana. Don't worry. <laughs> Oops. We'll get that later. My mom was worried all the time. Literally, we'll be late five minutes. Where you been? I told you nine o'clock. Mom, it's 905. No, the devil's out there. Seriously. We will be, we will be, we will suffer from this worry. My mom will worry for every who had mom like that. All right? I mean everything. I'll be home, quiet. Danny. I don't answer. Danny. Oh my God, the Lord took what? Danny, where are you at? That's why I think I have like when my wife called me twice, I get freaked out. I'll be like, what, Ma? I'm right here, right? We worry about everything, and this is this is my problem. Peace. I have a problem. I'm confessing. Pray for me. Now that I have two girls. Guys, guys, I'll be honest, guys. I, I'm, I want a gun. I want a pistol. And I want a boy too. Just joking, baby, just joking, just joking. Prophecy now. Because I, I worry about that, I'm telling you. I'm, I'm not joking. I have an anxiety. I have an anxiety issue here. If my kid walks outside in the stoop, bro, we grew up in the stoop. But my daughter goes outside, 
I'd be like, where you at? You good? She'd be like, yeah, I'm just watering the plants, Dad. What's wrong with you? And this peace, it's, I'm telling you, it rocks me. It rocks me. And I need insurance, and God is always pressing. And this is a great, it's always happening. And I think that God is like, listen to me, the only way to have peace is when you're in it, is when you're part of the circumstance. And then God reminds me, trust in me. So when I first moved into my house, it's Staten Island. It's another borough. When I first moved into my house, I lived in an apartment building back in Brooklyn, Park Slope. Park Slope. And my in-laws were downstairs. My brother-in-law was upstairs. So my peace was okay. Because if someone comes in, they take them out first, and then I run. But listen. <laughs> listen. But don't tell your parents that. So Listen. But what happened was is that this, I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys, I need this. I'm, I'm going to stick with this because a lot of us are living like this. And God wants to redeem you and pull you from this. Amen? Because we are not living in this worry life. We're not living in an un, unshakable life. We're living in peace. Amen? And I want to land on this because there's so many people. Loneliness is the biggest issue for Gen Z's. Loneliness is the biggest issue now. Their kids came in and suicide of loneliness. It's, if, you're, if you feel lonely, you feel no peace, it's like, it's like uh, smoking six packs of, of cigarettes. That's how bad it is. And so I'm telling you, when I moved to my house, I locked my doors. It's already locked, but I'm locking my doors. I'm, I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I'm all this. And then I put... Then I put a piece of wood on the door. Why? Because if it falls, I hear it first. And I'm like, and, and I've, been, I've, been, I've been there for two years. It's still there. And I tell my wife, I have anxiety. I have issues. I want to be delivered from that. And I know I am. And every day is a good day because it's growing in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. Because he provides this peace over my life. The Bible says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. I need to read that every day. Let your heart not be troubled, Daniel. Daniel. I got your back. So tonight, no more wood. Amen. Tonight, open the door and test it out. No, imagine that. Keep the door open. Why is it cold? Because I'm believing in peace. <laughs> One step by time. One step. We need to face these things in our lives. And trust in the Lord in means of chaos. Peace, Jesus gave us this peace. Jesus was the embodiment of peace. Calming the storms. Amen. In Mark chapter 4. Calming the storms with a word. And offering peace to his followers. His presence brought peace to troubled hearts. And his teaching guided millions into a life of peace with God each and other. God wants to give you this, and I pray that he gives this peace to me and to all of us that are struggling with it. He wants you to know that, as he teaches me, that the world is troubling, but he is in control. The world is troubling, but God has everything under his hands. The next one is patience. Who wrote that down? Patience is in scriptures in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bear with one another in love. Patience is an issue that we've, we're facing. We from New York, we're not patient. That's it. God gives an exemption. You're from New York? You're good. <laughs> it's in the scriptures. In New York salvation, patience out. <laughs> but patience is key because we want things in our lives so quickly. 
We want to Uber our, our stuff, our emotions. We want to, we want to, we want to ask for things right away. It's easy to get things quickly now. Amazon, the next day or the same day. That's the devil. <laughs> Everything is quick in our lives these days, but God is asking us to be patient. God's asking to have a heart that's postured to him, waiting on his time, not our time. Yes, we want a husband. Yes, we want a wife. Yes, we want a new job, but God is working. And that growth that's in us is going to be a dependency on him. Not dependency on the way you walk or the way you look or the way you dress. All right, come on, somebody. If I dress like this, he might look at me. He might say hi. I used to dress fly in high school. So why are you laughing? I used to dress fly. I used to have this Tommy Hilfiger shirts, put the collar up. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you guys look like that right now. Come on. I used to walk. I used to have these tacos. You know, the tacos is like these boots. And I would walk with click, click. And I would look, and I just wanted the girl to look at me. Just look at me, girl. Just look at me. She look at me. And I would look trying to find ways. And the Lord said, you're an idiot. Go to church. I used to go to, I used to, go to retreats. We used to call it Spring Fest, Winter Fest. And every Saturday night, all the guys got dressed up. We were in the flesh. Got dressed up with like, we would take pictures like, let's go guys. Let's worship the Lord. <laughs> let's go find a wife. And the Lord was like, go pray. And be patient. And that God gave me patience because I have a wonderful wife. And please pray for my wife to have patience for me. I'm telling you right now, if it wasn't for patience, you would not. I'm telling you right, telling you right now. Thank God for a patient wife. Come on, wives. You can worship the Lord now. My man right there is like, yeah. Right? She patient. Especially she's Latino and have patience. That's a gift from God. That's a gift from God, bro. Praise the Lord. Patience is what God has called us to do. Because God has something for you. But your time doesn't mean he's not going to give it to you. He wants to provide you, but he also wants you to depend on him. And that's why we ask, God calls us into scripture to pray. To get on our knees, to fast, to walk in that because that's where you will see the hand of God in the right timing. And every time it comes in the right time, you're like, oh, Lord, we, Lord, you remember. He's like, yeah, I, I knew this before you. You were just impatient. I want to show you in the process that you need to depend on me. I want to, why are you so close to me? Why are you so close to me? Because you depend on me. Why you see my hand? Because you depend on me. I promised you, you just need to wait on me. Stop looking around for other answers. And that's what Galatians wanted. We, that's what Paul was fighting with them. Why are you looking for other answers? Stop walking in the flesh. And be patient with me. Jesus was patient. Hello? We all here. Breathing because of his patience for us. How many times we had an opportunity, that God had an opportunity to strike us? Come on, somebody. That earthquake. Some of you guys got a little wobbly. Some of you guys fell. Listen. Jesus demonstrates patience in numerous ways, especially in his dealing with his disciples. Three years with them, and they did not listen. Three years with them, and where were they when Jesus was on the cross? Nowhere to be found. He could have said, let's start all over again. Twelve more. But no, he knew. P 
Peter, you will build my church. Thomas, here I am. You doubter. But I still love you. Despite this misunderstanding and, and failings of the disciples, he was patiently taught and guided them. This, his parable of the patient farmer waiting for the harvest in James chapter 5 reflects the virtue of patience in spiritual life and ministry. God has called us to be patient. Kindness. How many wrote that down? Anybody wrote that down? Amen. She confessed. That's me. <laughs> kindness is what God has called us to do. In, 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 in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says this. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. I'm going to read that again. But when kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteousness, things that we have done, but because of his mercy. Yes. Thank you, Lord. His kindness. His covenant with us throughout the scripture stayed the same. I will save my people. Kindness shows consideration and compassion to others. Acting of kindness can range from simply daily gestures. How many of you guys smile at your waiter? How many of you guys smile at the bus driver? You just go in like, what's up, thank you. Seriously, I'm not even joking. These things, it might be, I might say these little, little things here, but these things make a huge difference. I'm telling you, these things make a huge difference. Many of you came to the Lord because someone said hello to you. My father came to Jesus because someone invited him to his home. We don't do that these days. Invite people to our homes. How many people have a hospitality? How many people invite people to your homes? So let's be honest. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Not enough. Invite me. Get the bus out. Invite me. I'll come. Depends on where you're going, where you live. But kindness is a key thing. Seriously, I'm not joking. If you literally smile at somebody. And this is not a, if you literally just say hello, how are you, thank you, even, I'm telling you, even holding the door for somebody. It's so simple. But we Christians are so rude sometimes. Amen? We could be rude. I tell my ushers, don't be rude. Be kind and smile. If they're rude to you, please call me. No, seriously. Just text me. This person is rude. Take a picture and send. <laughs> you do a selfie. It was him. It was who? Tell me, because I'm too. We're, we're, we're our, our team, Janice and, and and her leadership and what we're doing. Literally, is telling people when they walk in here, you say, "What's up?" You say, "How are you?" How are you doing? Look into their eyes. And don't fake it. You're not called to fake it. You're called to show it. How many of us got to do that in our daily lives? I'm telling you, we missed the point. And I'm not trying to be, you know, nippy here. It's just truth. It's truth. I told you it belong. It's nine of them. But Jesus, man. He showed kindness. He was the best person to do it. Jesus' kindness was evident in healing of the sick. Feeding the hungry. Ministering to the marginalized. He showed compassion to those in need. Some of us show compassion for those who want to, to make you happy. Some of you guys put people in categories. That's another preaching. Some of you say, well, if you're not from this neighborhood, I'm not going to hang out with you. If you're not from this person, I'm not going to hang out with you. Some of you guys want me to come to Staten Island. I still struggle with that after two years. I'm struggling. You guys don't come and visit me because of the, the toll. But if you're so kind, Jacob, please come. Come. 
Jesus showed it. He lived it. Let's grow in it. And goodness. Let us, let us grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap. If we do not give up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Goodness involves persevering and doing what is right and beneficial for others. Some of you just have to go back to the person you hurt. The person you rejected. The person that you had a bad relationship. We have to go back and do good and make it right. Because the Holy Spirit is telling you, not you. The Holy Spirit is telling you to be good because your heavenly Father is good. The goodness of Jesus was seen every aspect of his life. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. His interactions were whether with sinners, tax collectors, the poor, and reflected his goodness. Can we do that? Can we hang out with the poor? Can we hang out with those who are marginalized? Can we hang out with those, the immigrants that are coming, the migrants that are coming? Can we hang out with them? Or are we going to put them in a category? Are we going to say, obey the law? Or are we going to say, how can I help you and serve you? I was called into a meeting in the city by ACS. ACS is an organization here in the city that takes care of children foster care system. There's a big facility in the city on 3rd Avenue and 30th Street, 1st Avenue and 30th Street. I was called in by a friend that we've met years ago. He worked in Crossroads, a facility that I work with kids that are in prison. He calls me up and says, Danny, I'm calling you because we have 90 kids in this building. And your reputation is good. And we want you to come in and the boss wants to meet with you. I was terrified. Sat down in the meeting. She says, there's 90 kids here. They're foster kids, but they come in and out. They're runaways. They're this. They're that. They're struggling. They're depressed and they're lonely. Can you help? Daniel Sanabria can't help, but the Spirit of God in me could help. The power of God in me can help. The church can help. The body that is filled with the Spirit of God could help. Amen? So I sat down with her, and I just told her what we did, and she goes, yes, they, 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 we're, your name is being talked a lot. Youth for Christ of what you guys are doing. And she goes, quietly says, I go to church too. And these kids need more than we offer. And she goes, they need Jesus. And I was like, let's go. Let's go. You can clap for that. Because I will call some of you guys to join me. As we bring in goodness, as we bring in kindness, as we bring in peace, as we bring joy, as we bring patience, as we bring faithfulness to these young people and give them hope. Faithfulness. Let's love and faithfulness never leaves you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Being faithful means being reliable, steadfast in our commitment to God and others. Value and upholding trust above all. She didn't call Daniel because I have a Youth for Christ name for it. She called Daniel and the team and the church because of their faithfulness. Staying loyal and committed to one's promise and responsibility. This includes faithfulness to God, relationships, and the words and the word. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was faithful to his mission. To the will of the Father, steadfast unto death. His prayer 
at Kissimmee. Not, not my will, but yours be done. That's faithfulness. Gentleness. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and lean, learn from me. For I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest in your soul. Gentleness is what God has called us to do. It's about strength and relying and being humble, especially in conflicts. I want you to approach others with care and respect, especially in conflict and issues. You can't, you can't hang out with your family and disrespect your family and go to bed at night. Come on, somebody. You can't do it. You can't walk around saying you're gentle when God gives you the opportunity and just fails in front of him. Jesus exempted the, the, the gentleness in, in his ministry, inviting all who are worried to come to him for rest. His gentle response to a woman caught in adultery. In the law, she's supposed to be stoned. But through Jesus, through Jesus, she was being gentle. She, loved, she was being loved by God. He showed his compassion over condemned, condemnation. This is a big one here, church. The next one. The last one. Self-control. This one's tough. This one we all are facing every day. This one comes quietly. This one comes in the night. This one comes in the morning. This is where the enemy loves to play with you. This is what the enemy wants to take you off the road to the purpose of God. Self-control, if not corrected, would lead you to disaster. If not called out, would lead you to disaster. I am not condemning you or telling you, but I'm telling you what the word of God is saying to us today. That we need more people in the church with self-control. We need more people in this city with self-control. There is a pandemic of people leading with anger, leading with destruction, leading with violence that is disrupting our city. This cannot enter the church. This self-control is led by the spirit and spirit alone. The Bible says in 2 Timothy verse 1 to 7, it says, For God gave you, gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love. And what? Self-control. A sound mind. This is what we're struggling with. Right? We all need to write this down. We're all falling. We're all struggling but the Spirit of God is asking you and giving you this an amazing gift. And that gift is going to grow in us. And that gift is to say no. Say no to the things that are not of God. Say no to the things that are trapping you. Say no to the things that you know if you go there, you will make mistakes. Some of us go there and say, I'm all right. I'm good. I can hang out here. Let me chill here. I won't do nothing. And guess what happens? We fall on our faces. I'm counseling, a, a counseling somebody in, in this time, and, and they were like, yeah, I was hanging out in his apartment. And I was like, what? ¿Qué, qué pasa? What you said? I didn't hear that right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're hanging out. We're just hanging out in the apartment. And I, and I asked one question. What question I was? What was the question I asked him? Are you alone? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We were just... I said, what? I wanted to take my belt off <laughs> and beat the kid. I knew the girl. I didn't know the boy. I didn't want to beat the kid. But the reality was is that we cannot fall into this temptation. This is, you cannot put yourself in a place that you know that you could fall. Right. Yeah. But, but, but we've been doing this for a long time. Ay, ay, ay. 
a long time, nothing happened. No, 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 no. That's the devil saying that nothing happened. Because one thing can change your whole life. We live in a pandemic of pastors falling. They build amazing ministries, but one decision changes everything. Cover your pastors. Cover your pastors. We could be amazing preachers. We can be great friends. But this self-control is an enemy to all of us. If we are not focused on Christ Jesus. Why do I mention all of these? Why do I mention this? Because the spirit of God is in us. And he's not there to just to hang out. He's there to move you. He's not just there because Christ promised that you have somebody. He's there to move in you. And every single mention I've mentioned here, every single word that I've mentioned, it's not just for you to say, I have all of it. It's for you to say, God, thank you. I could use it. And every day, all of these things are being used and are being implemented. And if you're struggling with one or two, I will give you the greatest advice that someone told me. He didn't say pick up a book. He didn't say go talk to this person. He didn't say go to this church. He said something profound and simple. He said pray for it. Ask and you shall receive. And so I'm asking God every day, give me peace. Give me self-control. Give me these things, oh God, that I struggle with. Give me these things, oh God, that I could be more like you and less like me. And we, as a people, need to confess that. Don't walk out of here saying, oh, thank you for the nine things, Danny. Thank you for I write these notes. I appreciate these notes. No, it's more than that. We need to walk out of here in the spirit of God to lead us into his direction, not our direction. I don't want to be known as Soul Cry Church because of an amazing worship team or amazing pastor or amazing ministry. I want to go to a church that's filled with the spirit of God, that's led by the spirit of God, that is taught by the spirit of God, that is producing the spirit of God and the fruits of the spirit. That's what I want to walk into. That's what I want to hang out with you. If you're struggling with something, I want to help you. If I'm struggling with something, I want to help you. That's the body of Christ. Not to come in and just say, hey, how are you? God bless you. See you later. No. Now you know my struggle. Pray for peace for me. Now you know my anxiety. Pray for peace for me. Let me know yours. So I can pray with you and pray for you. Let me know your struggle so we could do this together. The church of Galatians needed to switch up, and they did. And Paul was not having it, and we should not have it anymore. Let's flip tables in our homes and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's flip tables in our hearts and say, no, no, no more. I'm not living like this anymore. Some of you have to repent for the doubts that you live in and the loneliness that you live in. And know that the Holy Spirit is there for you to lead you, to guide you, to walk with you. And to produce amazing growth in your life. This is the church that's filled with the Spirit. This is the church that will stand on Jesus and only Jesus. When people walk in this building, they're not going to see fancy lights. They're not going to see all these good things. What they're going to see is the presence of God. That's what they're going to see. They're going to see vulnerability. They're going to see honesty. They're going to see brokenness. They're going to see redemption. They're going to see healing. 
That's what they're going to see. Because we're all growing in the Spirit. And I pray we're all producing the fruit of the Spirit and nothing else. If that is you today, and you wrote down something, you wrote down a fruit that's like, man, I need more of this. I need more of this. I didn't grow up in a home of kindness. I didn't grow up in a home of, of love. I need more of this. I struggle with this every day. I need the Spirit of God to transform my heart. And how do we build this? How do we do this? Your prayer life, your scripture reading, your community. That's how we build this up. If that is you, I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to call this thing we're struggling with, whatever fruit it is. What is it? Don't walk out of here without giving it to the Lord. If it's gentleness, if it's self-control, it's there. It's there. It wants to grow in your life. The Holy Spirit is, is tugging you to trust in Him. <laughs> Got a couple more minutes to, just to call it out and say, Lord, here I am. I need more of this. The Spirit of God. Teach me your ways. I don't want to listen to nobody else, nor the gospel, nor the way, but your way. I don't want to be confused anymore. I don't want to be stuck in this box anymore. closed I know you probably heard this in Sunday school it's through the spirit you saw all the fruits in the book but I will I will say to you this is the most important thing to live by because it reflects Jesus. You are walking on this earth reflecting Jesus. You are an apprentice of Jesus. You are a disciple of Jesus. You are a child of God. You are chosen and separated. You are a holy nation. You are a priesthood. You are adopted. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You need to say that to yourself and believe it. And let the Spirit of God dwell and work and live in you. 
and not quench it. I'm going to read you a scripture, then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song. Scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 and 14. It says this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these in the words not taught by human wisdom but taught by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept these things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to